Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Back to something that, that Cornell said, because I think it's really, really important. You know, Donald Trump, we know. We've seen him, right? We've seen him again and again and again have no respect for women, make crude comments about women, hang around with, what do we call them now, porn actresses. Uh, we, we know. <laughs> I, 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 just think, star. I, no, I just think you have, porn to, star. I just think you have to prove you're a star before we call you one. I think, I think that's... Absolutely okay. true. But I, we know that, okay? We know in the case of Bill Clinton that, you know, that's a man who likes to look at the ladies. We've seen pictures of him doing that in the last month at a funeral, okay? <laughs> that, and, and I think that that's the, that's the difference between the Cosby case and this. This is the word of, of one person, and I never want to dismiss the pain of an individual. I never want to say that you should not that you should be afraid to come out. I have to question the fact that there's no other evidence and that we are watching commercials about this man as if he is a serial rapist. You know, someone once said, where do I go to get my reputation back? That's a reasonable question to ask. But what if, but, and I hear all that and I have to respect it, but, 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 what, if, but, what, if she's, but what if she's right? You know, what if this has validity? Should, should she not have her have her day is because it was 30 years ago does it she mean she she she, it. she shouldn't bring it up she shouldn't bring it up right now i think it's 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 a tough place to be and too often in our society women have not had their their moment even you know for for you know even if women who who who've been done wrong have not had their moment i, I think sometimes the me too moment can go too far Thank but you. i think it goes too far in, the, in one direction because we've gone too far historically in the other direction. That doesn't mean serving justice on somebody who did nothing wrong. I understand that people want redress, but that doesn't mean serving justice on somebody like that, and they deserve due Let, process. Let's talk about what I think is the, also the peril for pretty much... What are there? Nine, 100 current U.S. senators. We're, we're in the 100. I didn't, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> here, 99 or 100. No, no, we're at 100. Um, John Kyle it's fraught with peril especially for those that have been through this a second time. Here was Orrin Hatch. I'm going to play for you two clips. It's Orrin Hatch then and now. And, and it just shows you how easily you can step in a, I'll call it a pothole, uh, if you will, on this issue. Orrin Hatch in 91, Orrin Hatch yesterday. Here it is. One woman's allegations that are 10 years old against your lifetime of service over that same 10-year period. I've known you almost 11 years. And the person that the good professor described is not the person I've known. Whoever she is is mixed up. And, uh, and, but I can't speak for her. All I can say is, no, I don't. I know the, I know the judge very, very well. I know how honest he is. I know how straightforward he is. I know how he uh, stands up for what he believes and what's right. And uh, frankly, uh, if you were going to believe anybody, you'd believe him. Look, to defend the senator here a little bit, uh, chosen to speak about somebody's character, at the end of the day, there's a lesson a lot of us have learned in our business, all of these businesses. You don't know what you don't know about somebody. A professional relationship is not a personal relationship. That's right. and, you, and you heard him even say, "I'm not going to speak for her, but she's mixed up." <laughs> so it's I mean, a tra that's the that's what happens. That that is what become creates the political. Par it's like with the president today. I feel sorry for him. Here's the thing: if it's not true, I understand you saying that.
show empathy for everybody right now. Right, right. And Orrin Hatch is, I mean, he's, you know, he's Orrin Hatch. I, and I, again, I don't, moment, I, but, it, but, it, but that's the parent <clears throat> here. That's what we've all learned, and me too. Sure. How many people do we know that have spoke up well for Bill Cosby over the years that regret it? And I think the committee gets that. The committee is not <laughs> Orrin Hatch's friend. We had him on their show. I've, I've done interviews with him. I, I lifted him up as a, yes. somehow as a, as a figure of fatherhood on a radio show. I mean, you know. Absolutely. Okay, we, we love the guy. I'm not going to be somebody's character witness if I don't know him. And we pretend that we know people, right? I mean, I suppose this happens with celebrity yeah. all the time. And I'm sure for many of these senators, judges are maybe kind of in that same vein of, well, you embody the virtues and the sure. moral character that I think is good and the judges should They're also have. on their best so behavior. So I must know senators, you. Probably. But you don't know these people. You don't know what they do in the dark corners of their life. And, and I don't and, want and, to. You know, right. Well, the question <laughs> is then when does it become right relevant? Right and the question, and the answer to that is when the Senate Judiciary decides but, that it's but relevant. Have we, have we, we haven't talked about how much power this gives people, individuals. You know, um, I, I could turn around and, and say anything. I, I could say anything about any one of us, about anyone I've worked with. And people would say, well, you know, that certainly deserves a hearing. Uh, okay, but uh, maybe we need to have standards about this. Maybe we all need to agree as a society that there are rules that we want to play by and that throwing accusations is, is, is a dangerous road to go down. It is Wednesday, the 19th of September of 2018 and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine Justice Putnam and our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. That's right folks. It's merely just a a really nice hollandaise egg dish. You will love it. Indeed. Well, uh, I don't quite think that uh, Trump has dumped the classified material yet but Devin Nunez is chomping at the bit. And we know what happened the last time he got a bunch of uh, declassified material. And uh, the result of that is that uh, people became even more convinced that uh, Trump is a Russian asset in the White House, bent on destroying America as we know it. And he's doing it quite well. Indeed. Uh, the... A uh, woman from the American Enterprise Institute at the top there. Uh, Senior VP Daniel Pletka. Worrying that women might have too much power. I mean, just throwing accusations around willy-nilly. Yeah, well, there is some uh, reportage coming through from classmates of Dr. Ford. Who said that actually... That incident had been talked about for days afterwards. Need to follow up on that. Uh, if that is a true assessment, it's a game changer, is it not? And what's up, Mark Judge, the friend that, like, uh, the, the other frat boy loser with Kavanaugh, uh, is not going to testify. He doesn't want to testify under oath. Well, of course not. <laughs> What misogynistic uh, frat boy loser would? Of course not. And he's not only a misogynistic frat boy loser, he's also pretty much an, an entitled bigot. Yeah. I read the book! <laughs> yeah, such as it is. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, uh, we need to put those kind of people on the Supreme Court. Mostly because uh, Trump thinks he's living forever. And uh, he will need pardons uh, into infinity. He'll need to be pardoned all that time because he's got a lot of big plans for the universe. Changing the order as it is. And, and, and evangelicals really do believe, and I'm not joking about this, they really do believe that Trump is the second coming of Christ. And I can prove that Trump is God. He, you know, God's omnipresent, right? Well, Trump has claimed to be in two places at once. He was at the same time. He was uh, digging through the rubble at 9-11 to rescue his friends. He also was able to watch thousands upon thousands of Muslims cheering in the streets of New Jersey at the fall of the Twin Towers. Only God can do that. Uh-huh. Well... 
I believe in a separation of church and reasonable thinking, okay? Because, I don't know. What's on the rest of the menu? I mean, I can only go on about that for so long because we curated a show. We always do. And on the rest of the menu in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, politically powerful Columbia Gas Company faces demands for accountability after the deadly Massachusetts gas explosions. Yeah, deferred maintenance, 50 years or more, no big deal. The lawyer for the ultra-nationalist Proud Boys organization was arrested for lying to police about his, quote, stolen guns. Yeah, were they? Apparently not. And the murder trial of indigenous and environmental rights activist Bertus Caceres falls apart. And it could be years before justice is finally served. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Trump officials claim they are unaware of health risks associated with child detention, in spite of research in their own departments. Because ignorance is bliss, especially when in front of a congressional and senate panel. And German doctors treating Pussy Riot member Piotr Verzilov say it is highly plausible he was conveniently poisoned, just like the other convenient poisonings. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Homepage at netrootsradio.com. You will notice the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Do check out her show at the table on Saturday afternoons, early evening. Well, that's 3 p.m. on the West Coast, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And uh, then later on uh, that night, she teams up with Ricky for the Round Table Roundhouse Power Hour. So that's at 9 p.m. on the West Coast, midnight on the East Coast. So Kelly Lincoln. 3 p.m. on the West Coast, 6 p.m. on the East Coast for At the Table with Kelly Lincoln. And then the Roundtable Roundhouse Power Hour, 9 p.m. on the West Coast, midnight on the East Coast. So check that out. So the chat room link, of course, is where you can engage us. And Kelly does monitor that quite diligently. We'll get back to you right soon. Yes. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com uh, is the contribute button. Uh, do become a Patreon. Uh, all kidding aside, we are unable to do this without you. And uh, I hate admitting it, but but uh, the, the the costs go up. They, they don't really give anybody a break anymore. It's sort of a drag. And uh, I should also mention uh, some critical equipment here at the mothership is going to be needing replacement and refurbishing. And uh, we're going to need some funds for that. I apologize that I have to make these entreaties, but I do. So thank you for your generosity. (laughs) All right. Uh, You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Check us out on Facebook. we got a Facebook Live thing going on. Thank you, Kelly, for doing that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, an integral part of the show. This is really a multimedia operation. Yes, it is. You can follow the show on uh, Facebook at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But over at Twitter, we are uh, the handle is at Cookbook West. So West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is at Cookbook West on Twitter. 
And lastly, you can find podcasts of the show by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, YouTube, etc., etc., etc. Okay. This uh, first article here uh, at the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is Out of Think Progress by Mark Hand. Uh, the San Bruno uh, disaster, uh, gas explosion, could serve as a template for uh, uh, legal action and uh, just really fixing the problem, too. And uh, one of the big uh, uh, results that came out of the investigation and the trial is that the company, the gas company in San Bruno, California, deferred maintenance in some cases almost 70 years on laid pipe. That's uh, probably too long. Residents of Lawrence, Massachusetts, complained regularly in recent months to their local gas utility about the smell of natural gas. They called Columbia Gas of Massachusetts multiple times to report the smell of natural gas. Every gas company urges customers to call if they smell gas, only to have the utility tell them that, well, it's normal to smell gas in your neighborhood. It's too early to determine if the constant smell of natural gas, as reported by the Washington Post, was related to last Thursday's deadly series of fires and explosions in Lawrence and the neighboring towns of Andover and North Andover, Massachusetts. The NTSB, which is serving as the lead investigative agency, is expected to look at the circumstances leading up to the disaster. State and local lawmakers appear to be prepared to hold the politically powerful Columbia Gas, a subsidiary of Nysource Inc., accountable if it is found that the gas utility company was at fault for explosions and fires. Well, what I heard is that they were doing pressure tests, which is normally what is done. But if you have deferred maintenance on a pipe, and what does deferred maintenance mean? That means that they have to shut down the pipe. They have to evacuate the gas out of that pipe. And they put in what is known as a pig. It's a machine that goes through the pipe, measures the inside diameter, but most importantly looks for bad wells, wells that have de deteriorated over time. And in some cases, pipes should be, uh, the pig should be thrown in, you know, every five to seven years. What happened in San Bruno is they said, well, you know, it costs money to shut down all of this. And then, then, then if there's a problem with the pipe, we got to fix it. That costs money. We'll do it next year. And then next year became next year. And the year after that became the year after that. And the year after that became the year after that. The next thing you know, 50 years have passed. 70 years have passed at some lengths of those pipes. They did a pressure test. And the pipes exploded. And that sounds what happened here. There was some speculation, you know, Duke Energy had been hacked by uh, Fancy Bear. And there was some speculation that maybe uh, the pressure increase could have been done from afar. Not in this case. This was so obvious. This was so telling. We've seen this before. We saw it in San Bruno. Well, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities will be conducting its own investigation into the disaster. The Office of Attorney General, which also serves as a state consumer advocate, will work to make sure the Department of Public Utilities' investigative process remains transparent. Of the 8,600 gas meters that were shut down after the disaster, 5,515 of them are, in, are located in Lawrence, a working-class city. A large percentage of the city's 80,000 residents are recent immigrants from the Caribbean or the Caribbean. The disaster also struck middle-class areas of Andover and North Andover. Over the weekend, most residents whose houses were not damaged or destroyed were allowed to remain home. 
But utility officials said it could take weeks for the company to conduct safety inspections and restore service to the residences, of course. Well, a Columbia gas spokesperson said he could not offer any insight into what caused the fires and explosion until the NTSB has completed its investigation, because you don't want to tip your hand that you know that you're at fault. Let them figure it out, and uh, then you'll have a hearing, and then you can waffle and waver and say that it was really some guy way down the line that made a mistake. Oops, sorry. Brigham of Raw Story brings us this next offering here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The attorney who represents the ultra-nationalist Proud Boys organization was arrested by Texas authorities for filing a false police report alleging he had three guns stolen. Jason Lee Van Dyke called police on September 13th to report that someone had stolen three guns from his pickup truck. Van Dyke claimed he scared off the thief when he burnished a firearm from his house. But the story began to fall apart when Van Dyke's roommate told police a different story. The roommate said the guns had gone missing earlier in the day, before Van Dyke called police with the burglar story. And the brick the thief allegedly used to break into the truck mashed the bricks in Van Dyke's fire pit. Police concluded... Van Dyke had fabricated the burglary story and arrested him for filing a false police report. I completely deny these allegations, and I look forward to being exonerated, and I've got no further comment, he told the Daily Beast. Presently, Van Dyke spends much of his time acting as legal counsel for the Proud Boys and engaging in spats with enemies online, the Beast explained. In 2014, he tweeted a picture of a noose at an, at an enemy and demanded he, quote, look good and hard at this picture, you, F, you, you effing enter. It's where I'm going to put your neck. Wow, he sounds like a really friendly guy. The Southern Poverty Law Center describes Van Dyke as a neo-Confederate lawyer. Van Dyke, however, has claimed the Proud Boys, quote, do not now nor have they ever espoused white nationalists, white supremacists, anti-Semitic, or alt-right views. Now get out of here, you dirty Jew. I'm sorry I added that last part on. <laughs> because that's how they believe. Yeah. Let's see. They are not white nationalists. They are not white supremacists. They are not anti-Semitic, and uh, they don't espouse alt-right views. Really? I think the tapes tell a different story. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is brought to us by Luke Barnes from Think Progress. Uh, this story is a maddening story to me, but not very surprising. When it comes to uh, justice for, uh, well, murdered activists in Latin America, it is slow in coming, if ever. 
On Monday, the high-profile trial of eight men accused of murdering indigenous and environmental rights activist Berta Caceres was supposed to begin. Caceres was murdered two and a half years ago after protesting the construction of the Agua Zarca Dam, and the trial could provide key insight into corruption and criminality in Honduras, a country already plagued by violence. But instead, proceedings quickly devolved into a force farce when the three presiding judges were accused of abuse of authority and the lawyers representing Caceres' family asked that they be recused and replaced. The Guardian reported that Caceres' family lawyers had noted a series of decisions demonstrating bias. These included refusing to reprimand the public prosecutors for not sharing evidence with the family's legal team, despite being ordered to, and rejecting testimony that pointed to a wider criminal conspiracy to kill Berta Caceres. The hearing was also pushed back three hours by the judges to allow for an unrelated drug case to proceed. Oh yeah, well, that, that's much more important than the murder of this woman who tried to stop a logging operation at a dam project. As of now, the trial has been suspended indefinitely until the Honduran judiciary resolves five injunctions filed against the three judges and resolves their recusal. And according to local activists, it could potentially take years for the trial to be resumed. Well, they have to put those other drug trials ahead of them. Berta Caceres had repeatedly reported death threats prior to being gunned down in 2016 as she fought against the Agua Zarca Dam Project, which would have cut off essential supplies from indigenous communities. Honduran authorities eventually arrested nine people in relation to the murder, including three former soldiers and three employees of the company building the Agua Zarca Dam. And they are known by the acronym DESA, DESA. The final DESA employee arrested in March served as the executive director of DESA during Caceres' murder. The suspect's backgrounds, coupled with the friendly ties DESA enjoys with members of the Honduran political elite, raises the possibility that Caceres' murder was part of a wider conspiracy. And this is only exacerbated by high-profile lapses in the case's prosecution, like Caceres' case file getting stolen soon after the murder, or the repeated refusal of Honduran prosecutors to share evidence with Caceres' family legal team. And in 2017, a report from an independent group of experts concluded that Caceres' murder was organized by senior executives at DESA, using elements of the state security forces, which had acted in partnership with the company. The report states that the evidence is conclusive regarding the participation of numerous state agents, high-ranking executives, and employees of DESA in the planning, execution, and cover-up of the assassination. And, of course, DESA has vehemently denied these allegations. Caceres, Caceres has not been the only environmental activist targeted. According to a July report from Global Witness, more than 200 environmental and indigenous activists were killed across the world last year for standing up to big business interests like large-scale agriculture and poaching. And more than half of those murders occurred in Latin America. And we have refugees trying to escape that. And apparently they are evil and we have to put them back into the maelstrom. Well, we won't do that after the midterms and certainly after 2020, will we? Let's get to our break. And when we come back, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, 
A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, one that comes out singing. British writer Nick Hornby is no stranger when it comes to obsessed musical fanboys. Best known as the writer of the 2000 hit movie High Fidelity, which was based on his novel of the same name, Hornby is back some 18 years later with the story of Duncan. He's a pop studies academic and diehard fan of a fictitious American indie rock musician, Tucker Crow, who released one album more than 20 years ago and then disappeared from the scene. Duncan's longtime living girlfriend, Annie, played superbly by Rose Byrne, doesn't share her partner's enthusiasm, which borders on the obsessive, and when she writes a scathing review online about some recently surfaced, unreleased tracks from Crow's fake famous Juliet Naked album, she is surprised when none other than Tucker Crow himself contacts her and agrees with every word she says. From there, the two develop an online relationship, and when Tucker subsequently announces that he's planning a trip to London to visit one of his children, she agrees to meet him. Juliet Naked walks the fine line between drama and comedy and delivers some real laughs, as well as some sobering reminders that most rock stars don't end up living the dream. Ethan Hawke wisely takes an understated approach to playing Tucker, and it pays off. Some of the best scenes are those with the numerous offspring he's accumulated from various exes. Tucker is flawed. Actually, he's a bit of a hopeless case, but there's just something about him that keeps the audience rooting for him. Add to that Hawke's chemistry with Byrne and Juliet Naked is one of those films that both women and men will enjoy. It's a sweet, witty ballad about relationships, starting over and staying optimistic. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Sea otters are pretty petite compared to other marine mammals, which means that despite their furry coats, they tend to lose heat quickly, and they need lots of energy to stay warm. So they need to eat about 25% of their body weight every day. Sarah McKay Strobel, a sensory ecologist at UC Santa Cruz. So we know they have to eat that much, but in order to eat that much food, that means that sea otters have to find all of that food, and that's where we come in. She and her team analyzed the otters' senses to solve the mystery of how they're such efficient foragers. Vision isn't reliable, she says. It's pretty dark and murky underwater, and crabs and clams tend to hide. Hearing is also tough for otters in a noisy underwater environment, and sniffing is no good either. When they're underwater, they're holding their breath. But what's left is touch. So Strobel and her team measured the sensitivity of otters' paws and whiskers. They blindfolded an otter named Selka and then presented her with plastic plates engraved with tiny grooves, kind of like corduroy. Selka's job was to choose the plate with two millimeter grooves, which she'd been trained to associate with a tasty shrimp, instead of plates with differently sized grooves. Turns out Selka could perceive just a quarter millimeter difference in the groove's width with her paws, above and below water, and half a millimeter difference with her whiskers. The fact that she was able to perform so well while moving incredibly quickly, I think is really interesting and suggests that, you know, sea otters have very quick decision-making abilities and very quick sensory processing abilities, which makes sense when you think about the type of lifestyle that they lead and how quickly they need to find food. The full details and a cute photo of Selka are in the Journal of Experimental Biology. For the record, humans can feel the difference too, but it takes us 30 times longer, which might make sense. After all, we evolved in environments where touch was less important in a hunt then we're sight and sound. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The English philosopher John Locke used social contract theory to justify the establishment of limited government. The Declaration of Independence, which reflects Locke's view of natural rights, states that people consent to government to protect certain natural rights, identified in the Declaration as the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
If government fails to protect these rights, the people have the right to alter or abolish it and establish a new government. The second of John Locke's two treatises on government is among the most widely read works on political thought and has been called the Bible of the American Revolution. This work has seen perhaps a hundred printings in at least 14 languages. Like the writings of Hobbes and Montesquieu, Locke's writings were placed on the Catholic Church's index of forbidden books. All were seen to undermine the theory of divine right of kings. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. You can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of netrootsradio.com. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Christine Blasey Ford told Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley Tuesday night that she would like the FBI to investigate her claims of sexual assault against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, potentially upending Republican plans to have a hearing featuring Ford and Kavanaugh on Monday. CNN's Anderson Cooper broke this part of the story Tuesday night and read from Ford's letter to Grassley. Christine Blasey Ford, the woman accusing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of sexually assaulting her, wants the FBI to investigate her allegations before talking to the Senate Judiciary Committee about it. We know this because 360 has exclusively obtained a letter that her attorneys have just moments ago sent to committee chairman Chuck Grassley. Reading now from the letter to Chairman Grassley that we've just received, as you know, earlier this summer, Dr. Ford sought to tell her story in confidence so that lawmakers would have a fuller understanding of Brett Kavanaugh's character and history. Only after the details of her experience were leaked did Dr. Ford make the reluctant decision to come forward publicly. The letter continues, saying, quote, In the 36 hours since her name became public, Dr. Ford has received a stunning amount of support from her community and from fellow citizens across our country. At the same time, however, the letter goes on, saying, quote, Her worst fears have materialized. She's been the target of vicious harassment and even death threats. As a result of these kind of threats, her family was forced to relocate out of their home, Her email has been hacked and she's been impersonated online. The letter then says this to Chairman Grassley. While Dr. Ford's life was being turned upside down, you and your staff scheduled a public hearing for her to testify at the same table as Judge Kavanaugh in front of two dozen U.S. senators on national television to relive this traumatic and harrowing incident. The hearing was scheduled for six short days from today and would include interrogation by senators who appear to have made up their minds that she is mistaken and mixed up. While no sexual assault survivor should be subjected to such an ordeal, Dr. Ford wants to cooperate with the committee and with law enforcement officials. And this is the bottom line, and I'm quoting, As the Judiciary Committee has recognized and done before, an FBI investigation of the incident should be the first step in addressing her allegations. A full investigation by law enforcement officials will ensure that the crucial facts and witnesses in this matter are assessed in a nonpartisan manner and that the committee is fully informed before conducting any hearings or making any decisions. Anderson Cooper then spoke with one of Ford's attorneys, Lisa Banks. Are you saying there has to be an investigation by the FBI or else Professor Ford will not testify? What we're saying is that there should be an investigation because that's the right thing to do. If there's not an investigation, would she appear on Monday? She is prepared to cooperate with the committee and with any law enforcement investigation. And that has been her position and it continues to be her position. So she will cooperate with the committee in whatever form that takes. And it remains to be seen. We have to talk with Senator Grassley's office and the other committee members to determine what form that will take. After meeting with the president of Poland on Tuesday, Trump took some questions from the press. So will you ask the FBI to open its file? How important is I don't think the FBI really should be involved because they don't want to be involved. If they wanted to be, I would certainly uh, do that. But as you know, they say this is not really their thing. But I think politically speaking, uh, the senators will do a very good job. Sounds they like really will. They're going to open it up. And they will do a very good job. Actually, it's not about the FBI wanting to be involved. If the president asks for an investigation, they'll investigate, period.
Trump went on praising Kavanaugh. I think one of the delay is acceptable, sir, on the uh, hearings for Judge Kavanaugh. There's some discussion that the well, accuser may not be coming in on Monday. How long is it? I mean, I think it's a great question, frankly. Uh, we are looking to get this done as quickly as possible. He's a truly outstanding person, as you know. He's got an unblemished record. Uh, this is a terrible thing that took place, and it's frankly a terrible thing that this information wasn't given to us a long time ago, months ago, when they got it. They could have done that instead of waiting till everything was finished and then all of a sudden spring it. But that's what the Democrats do. That's what they do. It's obstruction. It's resist. It's whatever you have to do. Meanwhile, video surfaced Tuesday of Kavanaugh from a 2015 speech he delivered, which doesn't seem to help his cause. We had a good saying that we've, we've held firm to, to, the, uh, to this day, as the dean uh, was reminding me before, uh, before the talk, which is what happens at Georgetown Prep stays at Georgetown Prep. That's been a good thing for all of us, I think. A trade war with China is escalating. The administration says U.S. tariffs of 10 percent on $200 billion of imported Chinese goods will take effect on Monday. China, in response, said it will retaliate with tariffs on $60 billion of U.S. goods. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross said Tuesday that consumers won't notice the price hikes that will come along with the tariffs. Average American family making $50,000 a year, let's say, um, how much do you expect these tariffs will impact them? Meaning, have, have you done the math so that so you know what, a fa- what, what an average family in America w- will pay once these tariffs go into effect? Well, you can do the numbers this way. If you have a 10% tariff on another $200 billion, that's $20 billion a year. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of 1% total inflation in the U.S. Because it's spread over thousands and thousands of products, nobody's going to actually notice it at the end of the day. I got the and that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener funded, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Kim Jong-un welcomed South Korean President Moon Jae-in to Pyongyang on Tuesday for their third face-to-face meeting this year and their most raucous. Moon arrived to a jubilant scene in the North Korean capital, but he's got his work cut out for him after President Trump tasked him with helping to set up a second U.S.-North Korea meeting. Things have kind of stalled out since the Singapore summit, which both sides not quite knowing how to move forward. Tom Kalina is the director of policy at the Plowshares Fund, which campaigns to eliminate nuclear weapons. If President Moon could help the United States and North Korea get back on track so that President Trump and leader Kim could have another summit later this fall, I think that would be the best outcome we could hope for. With countries like China and Russia increasingly eager to loosen sanctions on North Korea, Kalina says there's extra urgency to get nuclear negotiations underway. That's why we really have to get on with this. We need the United States and North Korea to move forward on the denuclearization talks because I think the international leverage with the sanctions will decrease over time and we want to strike a deal while we have maximum leverage. The White House says a second Trump-Kim meeting is in the works, though North Korea and the U.S. remain at loggerheads over meeting preconditions. To overcome the impasse, Kalina is advocating for a collective leap of faith. The Trump administration seems to be waiting for the North to make a move on its nuclear program before, for example, ending the Korean War and improving the security situation. But, of course, from the North's perspective, They don't want to give up their nuclear weapons until their security situation improves. So these things, you can't wait for the other. We have to hold hands and jump together. And that's the only way this is going to work. Luke Vargas, the United Nations.
for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 47 degrees. Yes, fall is upon us. We will be going to a high of, uh, well, about 75 today, maybe a tad warmer, maybe a tad cooler. Our lows, it looks like we will be in the mid to upper 40s for the foreseeable future, though we will be having a slight increase in temperature uh, tomorrow. We are expected to have a high of around 80. That'll be fine. Warm days, cool nights. I guess uh, my tomato crop is about ready to be pulled out of the ground. I've got a few more to come up. To, to come to blush and uh, so yeah don't get too gold on me now I guess I better get the Brussels sprouts in soon I better got the carrots in they're doing fine thank you very much all right so yes we that means that we are cooler than yesterday it is sunny right now and that should be the forecast for the rest of the day and tomorrow and uh, winds right now are out of the north northwest Light and variable at, uh, well, about uh, one mile per hour and should remain that until this evening when it will uh, shift out of the north proper at its usual five to ten mile per hour clip. And then we'll be uh, light and variable out of the north tomorrow. We did have a ever so small chance of precipitation, about 20 percent, but that has been taken away from us, snatched us right away. Give me hope. But we, uh, uh, looks like it will be relatively dry. Ragweed pollen is high. The air quality index continues to plummet. It is still in the good range, though, at 29, but it is better than it has been. And that daytime UV index is in the moderate range now at 5. Pressure is rising at 30.37 inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles, and humidity is 81%. No wonder my lawn is staying green. Thank goodness. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 71 and partly cloudy. Paris is 77 and partly cloudy. Rome is 77 and partly cloudy, though with a... Oh, and I should mention, both London and Rome are under a heavy thunderstorm, electrical storm advisory watch in which critical infrastructure like the electrical grid could be knocked offline. So be prepared. Kiev is 78 and fair. Kabul is 77 and fair. You don't have weddings on Wednesdays, do you? Please don't. It'll be raining drone bombs. Stay inside, folks. Okay. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 70 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is... I'm sorry, I just pushed it away. Sydney, Australia is 58 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. But New York, New York is 76 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And you would expect New York to be fair. And they are. It's New York. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people positively live around the world. offering here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays is brought to us by Amanda Michelle Gomez 
Out of Think Progress, uh, is there a more ghoulish operation than DHS and ICE and all of the umbrella, uh, you know, all of the the groups and departments under their umbrella? And and how do they vet their employees? I'm just curious about that. Tuesday's Senate Homeland Security hearing on family detention was tense as Trump administration officials struggle to explain the consequences of indefinite detention, including health risks for children. We're talking about indefinite detention of children, said Maggie, uh, Senator Maggie Hassan, Democrat of New Hampshire, to officials with the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. One DHS official attempted to push back, saying there is no indefinite detention of children, but Hassan quickly interjected, right now there isn't because of Flores, she said. And that's referring to the 1997 settlement, which prevents the government from detaining undocumented children for long periods of time. The federal government's top law enforcement agencies want to indefinitely detain immigrant families who enter the U.S. out U.S. without legal status while those families wait for a judge to review their full immigration cases. They argue detention, as compared to ankle bracelets, for example, leads to more removals and they want to deter migration. But they haven't thought through all of the consequences. Indeed, top officials had not even studied all the literature on associated health risks for children which became evident during Tuesday's hearing. Among other things, the 1997 Flores Court Agreement limited the amount of time the federal government could detain children who arrive to the U.S. with their parents, which generally means no more than 20 days. But DHS and the Department of Health and Human Services agencies, which oversee detention centers for parents and children, issued regulations that would terminate these extra-legal protections for migrant families. These proposed regulations have not been finalized and will most certainly be challenged in court. Executive Associate Director for ICE, Matthew Albans, and Acting Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner for Customs and Border Protection, Robert Perez, admitted They had not seen statements from their own colleagues at DHS warning that indefinite detention, like family separation, could traumatize children. Two physicians who act as DHS's subject matter experts warned in a letter to the Senate's Whistleblower Protection Caucus that expanding family detention, quote, poses a high risk of harm to children and their families. But neither Perez nor Albans had read it. Officials were clearly unconcerned with the health ramifications of indefinite family detention, as they had not even come prepared to talk about any of the literature. And that became evident during the course of the hearing also. When one was asked, uh, well, how long is too long? Do you think a child... Uh, should be detained in a detention facility. And that was Senator Gary Peters of, uh, of uh, Maine. I'm certainly not qualified to answer that question, said Albans. The Trump administration has long presented family detention as the only way to enforce immigration law and the only alternative to separating families, but it's not. In fact, Albans asked the Senate to dedicate more money to alternatives for detention after criticizing community supervision and electric and electronic monitoring. I think the private prison and industry complex has something to do with this, don't you? I mean, I think there's more money to be had in facilities rather than ankle bracelets, as if they need those also. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout 
c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. All right, finishing up here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article uh, by Frank Jordans of the AP that I got by way of the San Francisco Chronicle. Dateline Berlin. German doctors treating a member of Russian protest group Pussy Riot said Tuesday that claims he was poisoned are highly plausible, but stress they cannot say how this might have occurred or who was responsible. Of course not. It's another one of those convenient poisonings, and you can't point out how convenient the poisoning was. Piotr Verzilov has been receiving intensive care since arriving in Berlin from Moscow on Saturday, but his condition isn't life-threatening, said Dr. Kwai Uwe Eckhart of Berlin's Charit Hospital, as he told reporters. Verzilov's symptoms, together with information received from relatives and the Moscow hospital he was admitted to last week, quote, make it highly plausible that a poisoning took place, Eckhart said. He said, Charit Hosp- doctors have found no evidence whatsoever. There would be another explanation for his condition. Verzilov and other members of the Pussy Riot group served 15-day jail sentences, for disrupting the World Cup final in Moscow in July to protest excessive Russian police powers. That was when a bunch of uh, uh, the Pussy Riot group ran on to the pitch dressed as security force members. And then they were tra- chased around and tackled and then taken away. And uh, uh, basically showing the, uh, the power of the police powers and forces. Well, Eckhart said Verzilov fell ill on September 11th after attending a friend's court hearing in the Russian capital and was admitted to a Moscow hospital that evening with symptoms that included disorientation and widened pupils. Well, Russian doctors suspected possible poisoning poisoning, and treated him according, accordingly, emptying his stomach and performing a dialysis. Eee. He said the symptoms indicate Verzilov, who arrived in Germany by private medevac Saturday, is suffering from an, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this the way that my mouth has been working this morning, anticholinergic syndrome that can result from the disruption of the nervous system that regulates the inner organs. Now, there is some... uh, uh, consideration that maybe this might be uh, from, you know, like a, uh, a party drug, you know, because he was just party. Maybe he was at a rave. But the doctors pointed out that uh, this kind of poisoning would have resulted from various substances, including high doses of some har- pharmaceuticals and plants that contain particular toxins and the amount that it was taken would have been suicidal, and no one would have taken that amount. And, of course, uh, uh, Natalia and others of Pussy Riot said, he doesn't take drugs. And now, Verzilov is a dual Russian and Canadian citizen, and Canadian Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland said that she spoke with Verzilov's mother and assured his family he will have the Canadian government's full support because he is. A Canadian citizen. But uh, Natalia, Natalia and uh, uh, Nadeziev and others from Pussy Right said that he's probably going to go back to Russia because they they, they want to make Russia great again. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we're going to have to get out of here. Oh, my gosh. Well, stay tuned to Netris Radio uh, for all that breaking news. We'll be visiting with you tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Rest Thursdays. Indeed. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all that breaking news. And we will visit with you tomorrow right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver